Well, good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grody, your host for this program. What a pleasure it is to, uh, to be with you again. Uh, I'll use the word live, you know, given the, the crisis that we've been in for so long. And, uh, and it's great to have uh, a guest here in the studio. It's been a long time coming. So our guest is John Davidson. He is a revert to the church and a musician. And we're going to find out about that in a moment. John. Welcome to the journey home. Right. This is good. This is very special. Thank you, and I'm glad to glad to be here. So. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Um, we're going to talk music in a while. Sure, uh, sure. A little genre is a little different than uh, you know your genre and, and what I'm more used to. But it, it, it's interesting as we talked to see the long histories uh, yeah. and how God oh. has guided music. You know the power of that and how God's used it to change people's lives. And sure. I think that's a part of your story. But let me shut up and get out of the way okay. and invite yeah. you to tell us your story. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, b uh, born and raised in Tampa, Florida. My, um, you know, my, my mother and father, they, they split fairly early. I was maybe, maybe about four or five years old, but okay. just my sister and I. Um, um, dad moved to the Maryland area, you know, and they both had careers in law enforcement. So, um, right. so successful careers. And my mom comes down to Florida and, and she's a corrections officer. So probation and parole. She, um, oh, but wow. she had a, a, yeah. So watching that as we grew up and knowing that that's how she provided for us, that made a big impact on our lives. Oh. And, and I can tell you, you know, my sister and I, we'd be in the grocery store and people would run up to her and say, Ms. Rose, you changed my life. You changed my life. And we're thinking like, hold on, is she, you know, <laughs> but she's a big, bad, mean mom to us. <laughs> but uh, she was helping people rehabilitate their lives and get them, get them back in the, into the workforce. And, and, and uh, I didn't, we didn't understand what was going on then until we got older. So well, her strength that you saw as children was the strength that gave her to stand up in those difficult situations to help people turn their lives around, right? I mean, this is go correct. pushover, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I encourage anyone, if, it, if they know my mom or want to know more about her or, or know anyone who knows her, she is a unique woman. Uh, and she she worked for the FBI for a little while. I am gonna say it, mom, she's wow. probably not gonna like me for this, but <laughs> but she did, and, um, and then Department of Corrections down in, in Florida. So she's a unique woman, but she always wanted to find out how she could help people be better and, and, and using her own education and, and, and working inside of systems to help people just do right. better for themselves, you know? Well, the thing so. is that we too often think that, <clears throat> I gotta be careful saying we because I can't speak for anybody but myself, but too often we think that if you really wanna serve God, you gotta be in the church, do it in the church, <laughs> when the reality is, as John Paul II said, the front lines of the ministry are the laity and in the world where your mother was working. Yeah. I mean, that's where the rubber meets the road. You just the, said it all. Yeah. <laughs> where, it, where the rubber meets the road. I mean, it's, you know, we can talk all day. We can talk on the internet about things we want to do, the change we want to see. For me, opinions that come from people who aren't actually on the front lines, they, they have a lower value than people who are actually out there doing it. So um, you are, you are correct, and um, well, you said your your but their their uh, marriage broke up when you were early. Was there a faith element in those early years? So this is uh yeah, and and, and now that I'm learning more about their relationship, you know, as you get older, you learn more about right. your parents, yep. right? Things come out, and uh, and you find that yeah, they, they two different faith backgrounds. Uh, I believe you know my father comes from a, a Protestant um, belief system, and but. Um, I don't, you know, that wasn't necessarily the, the reason for the, yeah. the discord, um, but but ultimately, uh, my mom clung to her faith. She was clung, is that the right? <laughs> she was Catholic. Yeah, she she was Catholic. Uh, my uh, my grandmother's Catholic, and you know, I'm not sure at what point, but clearly at some point that, that, that faith was passed on to us through, uh, you know, older generations, and um, it was the, in, in New Orleans, Right in Louisiana is the uh, sisters of the Holy Family, the Holy Family nuns. They're the ones who educated my grandmother, her family, my mom, my aunts, and the Holy Family nuns are just all down in the southeast. And they were the the stern nuns that everyone hears wow. about. And those stories we would hear more and more about them. But what we realize is that that it helped form a lot of character for those kids, and it helped those kids realize that they were different. And they had respect for the sacraments and all those things, yeah. but uh, but meanwhile, you know, for minorities, as you know, like in right. especially African Americans, I mean, uh, we're kind of still like almost the outcast. 
because it's just, there's not a big population of African-American Catholics. Right. So, um, so needless to say, my mom kind of always reminded me that you're a little bit different. We believe in something, you know, that goes a little bit deeper. So I don't know that particular order of nuns. Was that an order of black nuns? Yeah. Uh, so started by which is uh, rare in itself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's wow. by Henry is a Henriette de Lisle, and and as we know, there's like five uh, African American uh, people who are up for uh, sainthood for canonization, right? Yeah. We know about Augustus Tolton and Julia Greeley, and you know, there's a number of them, and Pierre Toussaint, everyone. Uh, yeah. And and it's time, it's time for us, just yeah. you know, to finally start seeing more a, a, a more accurate representation of the entire church, the universal right. church, especially here in the states, because I I think um, you know we we know about the Saint Peter Clavers and uh, Martin de Porres, right? You see a darker uh, um, skinned saint and you say, you know what? I can be a saint too. And I yeah. think that's where it all starts with yeah. God. Yeah. And, and he does call us all to be saints. So, yeah. and, and we, uh, well, all of us, we recognize that, um, sin is a part of us and a part of that sin <clears throat> is lifting ourselves up above other people. And we all do that. Yeah, you know, sure. we all do that. But but uh, the one thing I want, uh, as I've been recently discovering, is that those black orders got a lot of persecution oh, from man. the rest of the church. It's yeah. not good, you know. And yeah. Lord help us. To I, us. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, uh, I think um, that's probably the more difficult part to deal with. And and I'll say this now. You know, I see a number of people online and in forums, and they're st we're, they're still struggling with it, right? Yeah. But at the end of the day, it, it's 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 such a beautiful thing because, um, gosh, and I know God's put this on my heart to say, but uh, when someone's persecuted or oppressed, right, it, it immediately places the ball in that person's court, and, and it requires them to respond to it. The, the crime happens, <laughs> yeah. and the response is now on the person who, who is on the victim. Um, and we know what the Bible says, right? True Christians. I'm not talking any of this, these, uh, but we know what Jesus said about forgiveness. And there's no way to look past the clear fact that you have to forgive. There's no way around it. You know, you could call it weak. You could call it crazy, but there's just no place for anyone in heaven if you cannot forgive the people who have done wrong to you or generations prior to you. So in my mind, I guess this was a conversation I you had in, with God in reflection. It's almost like a golden ticket. Yeah. If you are hurt or oppressed, it's your time. You're on the stand and you have to basically say, God, I want to forgive as you forgave. Well, the, the very first martyr of the church, Stephen. Ah, oh, my. And what's he saying there? On his way out, yeah. <laughs> you know, Lord, you are, receive me into your kingdom, yeah. but forgive them because he's modeling our Lord on the cross. Yeah. And I'll acknowledge it's not, it's a tough thing to do. Who right. can do that? Like right. it's, it, it has to be true. It's easy to point to someone else. In fact, <laughs> in fact, it was a black Baptist preacher that I heard a long time ago that said, whenever you point a finger, you got three point back at yourself. <laughs> the truth. We tell our little kids that all the time. Right? <laughs> right. So, but uh, yeah, yeah. So, and that's the thing. And, and I think also, I think once God kind of uh, helped me understand just in prayer and reflection that you kind of, you, the, we ever hear blocking your blessings, you kind of stop dead in your tracks. Like if you still hold on to any kind of, you know, uh, hurt, Well, you got to do something with it. Uh, <laughs> you got to get rid of it. When our Lord taught the Lord's prayer, his prayer, he said that. There it is. It's about forgiveness. If you don't Every, forgive. Yep. Most Christian, Christian denominations acknowledge the Lord's prayer. And if you can't at least pull out of that, what you need to do, then it's, it, it's tough. Yeah. So... <laughs> But it does begin with ourselves and, and those of us, especially that are, if we come from a heritage that is, is, uh, is guilty of oppression, Lord help us. Sure, and in sure. what way am I guilty? Lord help me. Because I just read a little, little uh, sentence and I was reading Benedict Grishel's wonderful book on, I am with you always on the devotion of Jesus throughout the history of the church. He says at the bottom, what is devotion? It's belief in Jesus that's carried out in love. Oh, my. Belief in Jesus carried out in love. Both are important, right? Yeah. And it, it, we can have all the belief in Jesus we yeah. have, but yeah. if it ain't carried out in love. <laughs> You've got nothing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You've got nothing at all. Um, there's a there's a, a Christian rapper. He's not, not a Catholic gentleman, but there's a line he says, and he goes, um, your love is measured by the hate that you can love through. 
So if at some point it comes to a stop and your hate overcomes the amount of love that you can give or the amount of forgiveness you can give, it, everything stops dead in its tracks right there. And, and it's not something we can do on our own. I mean, only God can help us do those things. That's the crazy part. <laughs> so. well, well, what you just said there is such an important key. Only God yeah. can help us. I mean, seriously. There's no mean, and to come to that realization is an evidence of the work of God in somebody's life when they say, apart from God, I can't do it. But for the grace of God, go I. You, know? you hear it a lot. That, yeah. <laughs> but, but still, that's, that's an awakening of grace. And now... Uh, back to your, your journey, sure. was this faith a part of your young life? So, so this is kind of, so here's the unique part of it. So my grandmother educated by the, these, the Holy Family nuns, amazing people. My aunts, uncles, same thing. Uh, they grew up in a household in Apalachicola, Florida, up in the Panhandle. Um, so at some point, they knew the value of that Catholic education. They knew it. They knew what yeah. was there. They knew that, um, you know, the spirituality, it, 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 there's no way around it, and that that would be an active component of their adult lives. Um, so at some point, my mom and dad split. She still realized that, you know what, I, I need to give him at least what I was able to have. So this is where we get into, you know, her, you know, a single mother at this point, uh, two young children, and... She's trying to figure out how do I make this happen? How do I get a Catholic yeah. school education hmm. for yeah? And we all know what that what, what that that phrase means these days. And yeah. you know, uh, unfortunately, you know, finance is coming to the picture as well. Right. And uh, and yeah, she would write the diocese. She would do everything she needed to do. We were parishioners, and she would say, "I I can't do this, but this is who I am, and I and I do follow the faith, and I am this person." I need this education for my children. I need, you know, and we were altar yeah. servers, all that stuff and yeah. um, all of our sacraments. But now this is what happens. So we're in West Tampa. Um, it's the Salesians of Don Bosco. Shout out to Don Bosco, <laughs> St. John Bosco. He's, uh, <laughs> he's something else because now I do realize exactly who he has been for me this entire time. Wow. And, and a funny joke, my grandmother, she joked about, uh, they were, they were trying to figure out what to name me apparently. And apparently my, my grandmother joked and said, I don't care if you call him Bosco. <laughs> and I don't realize, I don't think they realized what they were speaking <laughs> over my life at that moment, joking around. So, um, so that was pretty crazy. Um, so we're, we're there with the Salesian sisters. So, so what well, you were John after him though. Yeah, well, we named John after John Bosco. Or? So John, so my father actually was John Levi Davidson okay. the third. Right. I'm John Levi Davidson the fourth, okay. and now there's a fifth as well. Oh, but the God. crazy part is that when you look closer at the name, and this is what something God had me do, and I realized, okay, this is a little, this is a bit much going on in this name. Um, but we're here. I am in West Tampa with Salesian sisters, and they're in their, you know, they're all white habits, and and I couldn't get over it. They were out there with us playing dodgeball with us, basketball. They're, they're hitting us with dodgeballs. We're hitting them. We're having a great time. And, and I didn't realize what I was witnessing, but it was just the joy of Christ and these women. Wow. It just like, it, it enamored me. I was just, I, I couldn't get it, you know, and I didn't feel like I was one of three black children in a class. I never, we never felt yeah. that at all. There was just this innocence in this, in this, in this great setting that, uh, that, that created this just nature in me or helped create the nature in yeah. me. And I could never abandon that, no matter what the world did to me, and no matter how many times I try to forget it. Um, That's um, the way it should always be. So, it should be. Our, our guest is John Davidson. Well, you know, if we ended the story there, it sounds like you just got your just life is just, <laughs> is just straight away. <laughs> everything is great, uh, huh? <laughs> woo, yeah. I mean, everything's just you're off uh, in a good start. In a wonderful world, absolutely. <laughs> uh, fortunately, we are on this wonderful place called Earth, and uh, it's just and it's just a journey. Thank goodness. Thank goodness this will, you know, lead to something even better for 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 those of us who, who choose to follow the path and you know for the grace of God. Um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, you know, uh, stations of the cross and doing and altar serving and doing all that stuff young. Um, but I do want to say this, though, maybe I'm in second or third grade and uh, the Rodney King beatings and all that stuff starts to happen. Yeah. So imagine yourself. And I want everyone to kind of think about this. Close your eyes and picture your, uh, I don't know, a, an eight year old boy. And the, the riots are happening everywhere and you're in class and the teacher's explaining this to everyone. You're a young boy and you, you close your eyes. And you wake up and you realize, or you open your eyes, and you're the only one with darker skin in the room. And right away, there's so many emotions that run through a young child's head. 
And unfortunately, there are, are adults, right, who have the responsibility of kind of just guiding a child. Because if not, I'll tell you what happens. Rage enters yeah. fairly quickly. Rage comes in. It's like, why us? Why slavery to these people? Why for so long? Why was this? Why? Why? There's so many whys that come in. Yeah. But then uh, only God, he comes right back in after it. And he just continues to, to, to um, you know, just be there for you. Right. And, and as long as you keep asking the whys and you understand what's good and what's bad, he has a unique path for everyone. Uh, but yeah, so being young. And so, so God I, got you through that time. That yeah, he did. Time. And I remember crying in a classroom. There's only maybe two African-American students in the class. And I'm thinking, this is so wrong. Like, this is so wrong. But these are my friends. <laughs> yeah. It's so, so such a conflict. So, you know, you grow up, you get older, play sports here and there. Um, and as you get out of middle school, sports help. I can tell you that, right? Sports help. <laughs> Everyone loves sports, right? We're in America. Um, and uh, sports help. So football was a thing. Little League football. Uh, Although I'm actually... I miss it right now, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I didn't know if we were going to bring that up or not. But then the time we we're in, and I don't know if this will be, you know, it'll be at a later time where people understand it. The time we're in right now, this day, this date, uh, everything's on pause. Everything's on yeah. pause right now. And it is the most interesting and unique and unfortunate and yeah. there's so many words to describe it and uh, cuz you have to remember for some people that is religion or that is yeah. the center of their life and i think god has finally caught us and, and told us to hang tight for a bit and have a discussion with me <laughs> yeah. no, it's, it's, so that's seeing the the value behind the time we're on because yeah. Puts everything in perspective, and do, what did we take for granted? Absolutely. But yet, you're saying that at that time in your life, sports was a... Oh, a, a, man, it was king. You know, you start doing well at something. Maybe it's basketball. For me, in middle school, basketball actually started to become a sport. When I was younger, it was, you know, it was football, uh, and, and it's cool because I played with a bunch of guys who went on to the NFL, and wow. I'll never forget seeing my one buddy... Uh, playing in the Super Bowl against the Patriots and the Eagles. And I was just like, so being close <laughs> to all that talent, like, and we were good, man. We had a team that just we couldn't be beat. When, uh, but then, you know, you kind of age out of that. You wait out of it. Um, eighth grade comes along. It's time to make the decision for high school. And you've got kids going everywhere. And I tell my mom, I say, Mom, look, if I go to this school, I can. Uh, I think I can get a football scholarship to pay for college. And they'll take some of the, the, the stress off of you, you know, and um, – yeah, but I didn't understand the cost behind yeah. the tuition and all that stuff to go to these private schools. Yeah. Uh, long story short, I did actually play, play through the four years in high school, um, you know, regular teenager, had a couple of offers on the table. Cool. I kept a lot of those letters and those things. <laughs> the bigger school started to fade away. The smaller school stayed around. As I started getting denial letters for some schools for academics, because um, I would have even walked on to a school. There's no big deal. But, but when I realized academically, I was underperforming intentionally. Right. I knew it was a bright child, but all the homework and all of the uh, and I was taking just the, the, the and I'll say it the lazy way out. And I'm thinking like, why, why, why the tests? Why this? And I want to play sports. I'm tired. I can't do all the work. Um, and I wasn't preparing myself for college. I, uh -huh. And um, but at the end of the day, when those denials started coming through, my mom said, you know what? There's about four schools that still want you to go. You need to call that coach in Kansas at Benedictine College. <laughs> <laughs> Coach Larry Wilcox, he's one of those, you know, he's got a bunch of wins. And uh, I had some buddies who went to play ball for him. And they said, John, come up here to Kansas. We beat everybody. It's great. You'll get a ring. <laughs> and I'm thinking like, oh, yeah, here we go. Like, you know, sports are king. At this point, God's completely fading away slowly out of my life. Even though I'm getting ready to head from a Catholic high school. And I went to public school a couple of years in middle school. But going from a Catholic high school to a Catholic oh, college. Meanwhile, and, and, and as of right now, Benedictine has done amazing, great, wonderful things. Right. All of these new residence halls and all this cool stuff. And uh, I'm so proud of that school. But in 2001, there it was. I was leaving Tampa, Florida, the only place I've ever known. Went to uh, Atchison, Kansas. Unique little town. <laughs> you know, and uh, has its own cool little history and all that. But there it was, football. I'm a college athlete. I can't wait. And some people say, oh, you didn't play D1 or this. I wasn't worried about that. I just wanted to experience what it was like to play at the next level. Yeah. And what I found out is Coach Wilcox, he had a bunch of talent. He was serious about the guys he went to get. And he knew that a bunch of us probably could have gone to other schools, but he uh, yeah. he has something special there. And so Benedictine College, and this is where the real falling apart happens mm. um, in terms of, you know, the faith is pretty much almost completely absent. 
uh, you know, you start experimenting with things in college, and unfortunately, you just kind of go down these different dark paths. And was it a wrong crowd thing, or just didn't get engaged at this Catholic school? Or, you know? it, it, it could be a combination of both. Yeah. I mean, I love those guys. I love the guys that I went to college with. Uh, we're still keeping contact with them yeah. to this day. But everyone knows right from wrong, and it, you know, and it's tough because yeah. everybody's doing certain things. And when you're far from yeah. home, everything seems like it's yeah. on the table. So. Uh, but you know, my mom would call, are you going to mass? Are you doing it? You know, and I'm like, yeah, ma, uh, and then yeah, maybe went once the entire year, but then you go to mass and you're in mass with all the people who are at the parties. And it's like, okay, now it's getting really cloudy, right? It's like, how can we be doing this? And we're all at the, you know, wherever the, the prior night. And, um, so meanwhile, I'm really not going to school. Like my grades are suffering and essentially drop mm -hmm. out at the end of the that first year and I, and you know and I miss those guys right we talked a lot, we talk a lot and we're like, we thought we'd be around each other forever and um and by the power of technology thank god we've been able to keep right. in contact but um but we had great times good people so I land back home in Tampa Florida in Tampa Florida <laughs> I have a buddy tells me, hey, you want to make some money? That all, that's always, <laughs> for the uh, record, <laughs> that's always going to be a little rough. And it just ultimately ended up working in, in nightclubs, nightclub security. And, you know, you're basically, I, we call it babysitting the party, right? So, you, <laughs> you know, you keep the peace in there, but... Uh, you're trying to keep some yeah. control over... Uh, a herd of cats, you, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you just said it. Everything you can imagine about just uh, nightlife in Florida. For like, uh, and that's the thing. I'm in Kansas. And I'm thinking, hold on. You know what? I could be in Florida re relaxing. I'm an adult now. I could live my life, right? And that, that freedom. Freedom is tricky, right? Because it's the freedom to do right or wrong. And God loves us enough to give us a choice to do either. Because yeah. he wants us to freely choose them. And, and uh, yeah, you know. Start loving that newfound freedom, and uh, my mom, she notices what's going on, and she's, well, you're going to do this, and you're going to do that if you're going to live in my house. And if you're going to come in this late, you probably need to just go ahead and find somewhere else to live. It's like, you know what? Well, mom, at this point, I'm making enough money. I think I will leave. <laughs> then there it is. So yeah, 18, 19 years old, uh, go live on my own, and, uh, you know, uh, and I took that job very seriously, though, you know. Met a lot of great guys because, uh, you know, you get into some unique situations in nightclubs, the fights, the <laughs> craziness, the, you know, just the, it's just complete chaos. And uh, I'm grateful to this day for the prayers of my mother still, though, and grandmother. They prayed me out of that place, and so did some other people. Well, as you look back, but at, at the time. Oh, it's great. It was, was, <laughs> at the time, at that time, was, was the faith a glimmer in you? Or was or was it just pushed way up? It know? was it was pretty far. But the crazy thing is, it never completely left. And 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 here's the thing: you when you have a mom who calls, who will still check on you, will drive across town and just show up at your doorstep, just here to check on you, just here to see how you're doing. You can't run from that, man. <laughs> what do you do with that, right? You know, and it's like, or or you know, are you gonna are you coming to Easter Mass with us? And it's like, so now so now you've got all these things that you were you know. Uh, all the customs and traditions of the faith. And it's like, oh, okay, no, I'm not going to go to Easter Mass. No, you go to Easter Mass. So, <laughs> so you know, so you, uh, what, what happens is, yeah, you never get too far. You never get far enough. You can get far, but God has his ways of just kind of just continuously reminding us that uh, yeah. this, you know, there's something way bigger than what, what, what you see right now. Um, so yeah, it reminds me of, of that verse in the opening of uh, uh, James, where it says, count it all joy when you encounter trials. And I can't remember the exact words, but basically saying, because we know that's how God yeah. tests us, yeah. strengthens us, helps us grow in steadfastness. Sometimes it seems he backs away. Yeah, He's backing away because he wants to grow. And so, sure. but, but you're saying, but not so far. It was always a glimmer there. Yeah, or, or maybe that's, and, and I, I would love to see how, you know, who understands him? Who knows him? No one knows. Maybe he does that just for people. He does, because at some point, I don't know. Like, who, who yeah. knows? You know, why I keep introducing these sacraments? Why I keep bringing these people back in my life from my childhood? Why I keep bringing these memories back? You know, I remember being a young child and I made two promises to myself. i never forget this because I actually did make these promises. I said, one, I said, one, I'll never forget this. I said, I can't, once I learned what heaven and hell were, I just remember saying, 
I can't go to hell. <laughs> I was like, I won't do it. It's like, who would actually do it if we actually have a choice? Problem is, people don't realize that, no. that the choices we make lead us there and that we bring judgment on ourselves. God doesn't do it. And um, But I remember saying, I, I, I can't do it. Like, who in their right mind wants to go to this place where it's just yeah. done forever? Um, and then two, I always said, if I, if, I'm a, if I ever become a dad, I, I need to be around my child because I did experience that absence with my father not being there when I was younger, but uh, you know, he's, you know, still, still a good man, right? He, you know, he supported us in every way he could, but I just understand the complexity of the relationship between him and his, him and my mom. And that's the unfortunate thing with broken homes. There's so many stories behind stories. And at the end of the day, you just have separation. And now we know that that's how the devil wins when he divides like that. So. And it's it, the data is there to show that when you look at the problems in our in our culture right now, that's a big factor behind it. Isn't it crazy? Isn't it right. crazy? And the same with the, the matters for matters of the faith, right? In terms of children yeah. who carry the faith on, if they see dad doing it, it we're just having yeah. that discussion. You mentioned that earlier. Yeah, yeah. your they, your son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, you know, uh, a couple of times now, and you know, I hear the kids in there. I'm like, what are they doing? Oh my goodness, they're praying in the room. Or they built a little altar in the room, and me and my wife are like, "You got to be kidding me!" And it's like they're just—they're only watching us. Kids are watching you, people. <laughs> wow! So I'll wow, praise God. We'll pause there. It's a good place to take our break. Our guest is John Davidson, and uh, we'll pause in the story before we come back or take the break. I just want to take the moment to remind you of the Coming Home Network, chnetwork.org. If you go to our website. You're going to encounter a lot of other stories like David, or like John, excuse me, and um, especially if I was glad that we we broached the issue of of, of African Americans in the church. And uh, we, if you wonder, there, there aren't very many conversion stories. Well, we have a few on our website. In fact, some people have often said, "How come you don't have more on your show?" Well, we're we're looking for for guests, you know, and I think that there aren't as many, and that sure. that's something that we continue to be challenged on in our outreach in the church is we got to break through barriers to get the, the word of Jesus Christ out there. Uh, and God's put us in places where we have a witness. So if you go to our website, you'll find out more about uh, the stories of men and women who've been drawn by Christ back to the church. So let's come back in a moment. We'll hear, pick up on John's story in a moment. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host, and our guest is John Davidson. And uh, we've paused you at a time in your life when, yeah, the, the faith was still a glimmer in there, and your mother was still giving a, a, a good <laughs> challenge once in a while, but you were... Oh, it was done, and, you, you know, and I was using my adult freedom to basically say, hey, let me live. I, you know, I'm not that the altar server. I'm not the altar boy and all that stuff. It's, it's done. Um, but... Um, but yeah, you go through trials and tribulations yep. as a young adult, especially a young adult, when you make decisions that aren't that wise. Yep. And and I'll, I'll tell you, you know, I've gosh, I've been I've rested, I've been all kinds of things, right? But I would every time when I would say, God, can you help? I know we haven't talked in a while, and I would watch things happen, <laughs> or, or charges would be dropped, or if they would understand that it was a misunderstanding, and I'd walk off scot free every single time. So real <laughs> prayers happen in jail. I'll say that now. Um, and um, but but yeah, and um, and th- and that's the thing. He'll will it. He'll allow it, just to see what how you respond. Yeah. And uh, but yeah, I remember praying some of my first real prayers in jail. Uh, gosh, I was fourteen once, and um, I think we were all fourteen once. But uh, uh, I was shooting fireworks in the neighborhood one summer. Someone thought I had a rifle and guns. They called a SWAT team. I've got the news articles. It's crazy. Two SWAT teams brought me out of the house and looking down those barrels when I was 14, 15 years old, I thought life was over there. I remember saying, I guess this is how it ends. You know, so fast forward, you have a bunch of other near death experiences and it kind of gets old. You do get tired of it. It's like, <laughs> I'm, I'm done with this. Um, and, uh, but yeah, those prayers in jail where it's basically like, you know what? I will quit it all. I will give it up all up. What do you need me to do? But, uh, and you got to have those conversations with God, yeah. you know, uh, or you look in that Bible and you see the promises or the, the ways he's come through for other people. It's like, can you do this for me? <laughs> it's really <laughs> what it comes down to. Yes. And it goes, he doesn't ask for anything in response, but 
you know how you need to respond. You need to share the gospel. And uh, so at some point, and so at that point, you know, uh, I had two roommates. We all worked at a nightclub together. But I start uh, constructing an altar in my closet. I'll never forget it. I had a suitcase, threw something over it, start getting all this stuff. Uh, just these focal points, these, these physical things, right? I know we get criticized a lot in the Catholic faith for having these things, but we need things to help us focus, especially yeah. in this day and age. So yeah. maybe a crucifix, uh, uh, an image of Christ. Um, and I remember getting these things blessed in the confession. And it all starts with confession. Let me start, let me say that now. <laughs> Go to confession, right? It's the hour long confession. It's that one you know about, that, that first confession back where you just pour it all out. You say, you know what? What does it hurt? Right. Especially when it's been outlined or Jesus told us that we need to do this to one another and we do it already. Friends confess the worst things to each other all day long. God set up a platform. He set up a way for us to do this the right way. Yeah. And I think once confession happens, you know, something happened and you feel the weight lifted off of you. And then the, and you're always asking what's next. And for me, and that's how I am. I say, what's next? It's like, well, remember communion? Yeah, cool. What is communion? So it's like, you know, you grab the Bible again, you grab, okay, cool. There was a last supper. I don't care if you're Protestant, Catholic, it doesn't matter. It was a last supper. They broke <laughs> bread and he definitely told us to do this in memory of him. It's like, why is everyone not focusing on that? And for me, I couldn't get over that. I could not get over it. <laughs> I hear there's a, a catechism, of the Catholic church. I'll never forget. I break that thing open. I was on a couch one day, uh, still in my apartment with my two uh, friends. We worked at the nightclub. And the first couple of the words of catechism it struck me like an arrow, like through the heart. And it just, it was just, and I couldn't believe it that this supernatural world was actually real. I'm 22 years old at this point and, and I couldn't believe it. And it, it, it kind of seemed like everything did keep pointing back to the last supper and the Eucharist. And I'm just blown away at this point. And I'm thinking, you can't be real. That host, that wafer, that cracker, whatever people want to call it is really him. And it's, it, it's mind blowing. And it said, can I accept it that way? And it's and at the end of the day, he's just asking you, do you believe? Like you feel him asking you. And uh, anyone who knows me knows that I've got a very creative imagination and things. So I'm thinking the God who created everything, why, why would he not have left something this simple huh. under the appearance of just simple things? Why would he not have actually meant this literally? Like, and, it, and that's when I realized like this, is, there's no, there's nothing else, but I'm still hungry for Jesus flipping through the channels. Right. And I'd see different channels and, you know, you got pastors and preachers, you know, the suits and all that stuff. I'm like, yeah, he looks like me. I love this. He's talking about Jesus. Look at that big congregation. This is amazing. Cool. Keep flipping through the channels. See, see father Benedict Rochelle or father Mitch or, or web of faith with father uh, yeah. John and, and, uh, and, and they're preaching the same truth but they don't have the flashy suits and they didn't have the, and I'm just like, why would a man de devote his whole life to the truth and not want anything from this world? And then it just started clicking. And I realized like, oh my goodness, is there a vocation? What am I doing? And then I remember talking to priests and going on altar boy retreats and, and thinking, you know what? And I just started, it, it, the journaling helped. I started mm. keeping these journals just cause I couldn't believe what was going through my mind and my heart. And I just had, and I would go in the park and I would write in these journals because it was an active conversation at this point. And I didn't re realize that God that was that personal. I didn't realize he was just such this personal God who he's, he, you know, he's complex and he's simple. And he'll just keep asking you. He'll just like, he leaves these breadcrumbs. It's ridiculous. <laughs> and it's like, you keep, and the deeper you go, it's like, and it becomes more beautiful. I, I, I can't remember who said it, but someone said, the thing with God is the more you chase him, the more you catch him. And I, I can't get, I'll never forget when I first heard that. And I'm like, this is exactly what's going on. And, and there would be just different people, different movies in my life that would kind of reaffirm everything that was happening, everything that I would see in the catechism that was helping me understand the, you know, literal and figurative in, interpretations of, of Bible texts. You know, you leave that up to anyone to interpret it. You, what do you end up with? 40,000 denominations yeah. of Christianity. Everyone's got an opinion. And I realized, gosh, I can go start a church tonight because this truth is so beautiful. The gospel message in its purest form People need it. They want to hear it. They have to hear it yeah. because people just want hope. <laughs> and, when, and when you turn on some of those channels and you see the guys with the flashy suit, you can see you can make big bucks doing yeah, it Yeah, <laughs> I got to tell you, man. And they're cool. They talk like I do. They look like, and then finally it's like, yeah. So, because I just wanted, I didn't realize that, you know, and I'm like, but well, why 40,000 denominations? That bothered me. It disturbed me so much. And then I remembered all the history classes, right? And the Reformation and all these things. And then it, and then it clearly pointed to the fact that evil does exist here, 
separation, discord, you start dividing a kingdom and you know, the devil wins every time. So, uh, but for me, I could not get off of the Eucharist and the sacraments. And I had all those things. Eighth grade, I remembered it all. My mom kept all the pictures, right? So it's like, she's got the little certificates in glass cabinets <laughs> at her house. So it's like, okay. So I'm reading into the power behind these things. And I'm, you know, like I said, I've got a, I've got a creative mind. I'm thinking, no way. What? Seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. What? What is this? I'm like, that's in me? So now it's like, it's like, oh boy. <laughs> so it's like, I do need a drastic change right now. Like I realized I do need to cut certain elements out of my life right away. It's got to be gone. Um, flipping through the channels again. And I realized, okay, you're watching, like I said, I'm watching some of the other priests and, uh, and some of the programs, gosh, Sunday night live life on the rock, all of this stuff. So you, man. You're saying you're watching EWTN. I'm watching e EWTN <laughs> poured into me. The, all of the graces of God, it literally, it, it felt, I wrote this somewhere, it felt like a supernova went off inside of me <laughs> when, when you add those sacraments to people who are just completely directing truth. Um, you know, you, you still have questions about the faith. Maybe you doubt some things or some processes or rituals. You pray to God yeah. about those things. Next thing you know, you turn on the television and Mother Angelica is explaining it perfectly as if God himself were speaking through this, this nun. <laughs> and then you remember, this is the same nun my grandma had on the television all the time when we'd be walking by her room and everyone knows the nun. I don't care if you're Protestant, Catholic, I don't care who you are. If you've ever flipped through cable channels back in the day or even now, whenever, <laughs> and you see the nun sitting there, she's the woman. She's the one. I remember I kept the little, I wish I brought the journals. There's a smaller <laughs> journal I kept. It was, um, when they celebrated her birthday, I believe it was her 90th. She wasn't doing so well at that point. But uh, and I remember just writing a few words to Mother Angelica in this little journal and just thinking that those satellites and, the, and her push yeah. to get just the, the, the gospel through radio and through television. And I couldn't I remember writing somewhere that those satellites that are up there broadcasting all these things or those waves, those satellites are, are literally like angels <laughs> in yeah. the sky that are beaming these uh, yeah. the grace of God through television. The word angel means messenger. I mean, oh. there you go. I mean, <laughs> so yeah. yeah. So there's times where, you know, uh, um, yeah, where I, I'll have a personal conversation, even just something brief where, where it's like, Mother Angelica, thank you. Like, how on earth would I have been able to, uh, to get a crash course in a matter of like days, days? Like you can go through a couple of programs and relearn all the sacraments again, yeah. coming back home. And it's like, um, there's a movie. Uh, uh, this, so this is good. This is really good. So the, t the tales have turned at this point. And I realize that, gosh, the devil's real. He's clearly been trying to kill me. God clearly loves me. He works and so they both work in different ways. And it's like, there's a real war. There's a fight. I've been yeah. fighting in these nightclubs yeah. for years, right? But there's a bigger fight going on for my soul <laughs> and the souls of everyone. I want in on that fight and I want, I, I want to do this. Like, so, uh, so there was a moment in time where, um, uh, I did feel a vocation that, that pierced my heart, same thing. And I remember telling my mom, my grandmother, everyone. And I said, I think this is it. I, and I reached out to the diocese and things started speeding up quite a bit. The emails were flying, went to a couple of, uh, discernment retreats. And I remember telling, uh, you know, one of the priests, uh, one of the crews, I basically said, well, if we if we serve a God who give us anything in this life, what is the stuff really worth? <laughs> yeah. It's him. It's, it's, it's him. We need now I get it. Why a man would give up everything, right. To serve a flock and to just chase God. Like the priesthood made sense to me and there's nothing anyone <laughs> could tell me at that point. Um, so, but, uh, you know, things kind of took their different turns. I yeah. ended up not doing that. Uh, I ended up having a, a child out of wedlock early. Uh, and I realized I'd abandoned God again. Right. I, it, you know, um, but he has his purposes and he brings beauty out of anything, right? So here it was, I started a, a broken home myself. Yeah. It, 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 it well, hurt battle, me. Like you're talking about, the battle goes on. The battle it, goes on. And there's that, that one scripture where Jesus says, you clean the house and then when you're not looking, seven more come, come back right in. in there. I mean, so just when you think hey, everything's great, the yeah. battle continues. Yeah. yeah. That was, everything's yeah. great. I'm, you know, you know, you, you meet people, you, everything's wonderful. And, uh, but then the battle, okay, the battle comes on and, um, um, but, uh, you know, long story short, my, my faith got deep in then. I moved back home with my mom. She'd catch me back there praying. And I'm thinking about that one promise I made. I need to be in my child's life, you yeah. know. And lo yeah. and behold, you know, I uh, just going through different processes and things, you know, I look up and next thing you know, 
I'm a single dad with a two-year-old daughter. And, and, you know, and then I met my wife uh, shortly after. And then we, you know, we have, um, gosh, look, I'm losing count. We had <laughs> we have seven more children after that. So this is, that's how we get the crazy eight. But it was God used my oldest daughter to bring me back again to say, wow. see, even though we were close, you thought you had this all figured out. It's like, you don't, you trust me, you know? Um, wow. So, but uh, the faith got even deeper though. And and once again, but but those years, those years, even before my daughter was born, just uh, looking at programming, that's the weirdest thing about it. Just looking at programming and testimonies, right? And, wa- mm-hmm. and, and watching people in this very seat on this set. <laughs> that's why this is kind of surreal for me. And just watching them uh, tell the story of God working in their lives. Yeah. Uh, it, it always blew my mind because that's when I realized there's something way bigger going on here. And How did the music part happen? Sure, sure. Um, so we got you in the back in the church. You're, you're married with eight kids and, you, you know, praise God. You know, yeah. Well, How did the music part happen? Yeah. So, uh, you know, right away I tell myself, well, you know, first off is no matter what, and this is kind of a Don Bosco thing. And, and I just want to shout out Father Steve, right? He also kind of, Father Steve Ryan, Salesians of Don Bosco, um, um, we just had very close conversations when I was dis- discerning the priesthood. And he realized that at some point when I had a child, he said, may you stay close to God, you stay in the sacraments. And it was the blessed, you know, uh, the sacrament, the Eucharist, yeah. staying close to sacraments and, and relying on Mary. Like I, it was just, that's one of such a taboo thing for a lot of people, but st- I've seen stuff start happening when I actually asked God things through her, and I would say, okay, you are. And I understand how moms work. I've got the, the, I've got a mom who's all over me my whole life. <laughs> so yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if, uh, if, if I can get some things accomplished here for the kingdom and for myself. And I said, and the promise was, God, I, what can I do? And he says, well, you know, I remember trying to make extra money DJing, and I put on the first record, and I'm in a, and, and right away you hear all this crazy filth just coming through the yeah. record. Yeah. It's like I'm a dad now, I can't do this, and I'm like, gosh, well, I can't do that. And uh, and I felt God just just hit me right between the eyes. He's like, you can make music, and I need you to make the kind of music you know I need to be made. It was as clear as that, not audible, but we know how prayer yeah. works, and it's like. Uh, he goes, you love hip hop. You love music. I need you to feed my sheep. Any of my friends know, anyone who knows me, they call me the sheep food chef. <laughs> so right away, and that was the verse that kind of got the music started for me. John 21, 17, for a man like Peter who denies him three times. And Jesus asked him, right? Like, how yep. you know, do you love me? Do you love me? He brings Peter to tears. He's like, Lord, you know, I love you and feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. So sheep food became the theme of the music and the yeah. mixtapes and mixtapes just kind of and finding other Catholic hip hop artists and figuring out how we can get the music to the masses. We got the power of the Internet. Our generation yeah. understands all this stuff. So next thing you know, you're in the garage, you're plugging up stuff. You're on YouTube. How do I get this sound? How do I do that? And next thing you know, you're booming, right? You're just knocking it out. And I was like, well, what matters the most? And for me, it was the Eucharist still. That was still the power for me. It was still the power. It was confession, the Eucharist. And I started the, you know, an unofficial label at that point. And I said, I'm going to call this 4MRP, 4 Marks Real Presence. (laughs) And 4MRP music was born in my garage over here uh, down in Tampa, Florida. (laughs) And I was like, I'm going to rap about the sacraments. I don't care who who likes it, who doesn't like it, um, because this is even more than art. Stop the music watch my life, like just yeah. watch my life. I mean, look what God's done, please, like <laughs> please find him, you know, uh, but the music is kind of that fun artistic part of it. Yeah. Uh, and so he's kind of manifests himself in, in different ways. So you put the music on the internet, found, uh, there's other Catholic rappers out there, Foundation, these are my brothers in Christ. We're God parents for each other's kids. And we, we've been to two World Youth Days Gosh, we've been to NCYC about three or four times now. Um, we, you know, collaborate with all kinds of artists all over the internet, and um, and the internet's really, in many ways, made this possible for you guys to have this kind of uh, uh, fellowship, koinonia, to do this work together. This right? Correct, it's lightning amazing. fast. Yeah. We can make tracks and albums right away, immediately, and then uh, everyone you meet, everyone meets. We do a show, youth groups start to find out about you, hear about you. I remember I was kind of goofing around. I was putting the music on the internet, just thinking this is how I'm gonna serve you, God. Whoever needs to hear it will find it. 
right? But what happened was a lot of people started finding it and it was like, oh boy. And it's like, hey, can you come do a show here? And I'm like, a show? I'm a married dad of five <laughs> goofing around in my garage, you know, working at an insurance company. I'm just, you know, and but, uh, but God just gives you so much confidence and especially through the power of the sacraments. Remember, I dropped out of school. I went yeah. back to school, finished my psychology degree, uh, the president of the entire university gives me a shout out in front of thousands of people, uh, you know, because they read the story and heard about it. Uh, so I kept going a bit further, got a, you know, master's in counseling. And um, and then out of nowhere, I'm doing a show at one of the youth groups. Father Steve Ryan walks in and says, I haven't seen you in 10 years. What are you doing here? I'm like, Father Steve, I do like Catholic rap. He's like, what? He's like, you gotta be kidding me, Father Steve. I've been all over the world. I've seen the Pope, man. It's crazy. Like God is like really wild. But he, you know, he like, come have a walk with me. We go walking around the property for a little bit. At the, and he goes, listen. In a couple of years, I'm gonna I'm gonna build a high school, a Catholic high school. Yeah, they're not gonna let you do that in Tampa. There's only three or four of them. You can't do that. He goes, I'm gonna do it. And you know, I'm crazy, and I'll do it. These schools are called Cristo Ray schools, right? Cristo Ray schools. There's about 30 of them now, 35. And more pop up every year. And it's for underserved students to get a Catholic high school education, college prep education. He goes, what is your degree in? I go, well, I've got a psychology you know, background. I'm completing a master's now. He goes, I think you'd make a really good dean at my school. If I, I'm like, you can't do it. <laughs> three years out, right? Two, three years pass. I'm working in an insurance company. I got insurance teams and all this stuff. And uh, and out of nowhere, he's like, you ready to go? School opens this fall. And I'm like, what are you talking about, man? <laughs> and he wasn't kidding. And that was in 2016. Uh, I've been rapping the whole time with Foundation. I love my brothers, Alfonso, Val Morale, Nico Santana, Carlos, El Padre Cito, Father Maceo Gonzalez, an amazing story, an amazing yeah. man. You know, so when you surround yourself with these people who who, who hold on to traditional values and and and, and uh, beliefs that you also hold, amazing things start happening. So my professional life starts taking its own trajectory, and now I'm actually giving back to kids who are just like me. You know, and so you became that dean. Yeah. So for <laughs> so here it is, 2020. We just graduated our first class, and we're sending all those kids off to college. And they all had similar backgrounds like me. I saw myself in every one of those kids over the past four years. Oh. And I can't believe what God's doing. He, he just keeps outdoing himself. And I, I don't get it. I get it, but I don't get it. It's like, <laughs> when does he stop? He doesn't stop. He keeps going. So I love those kids like my own. I've got my own eight children, but the kids at that high school know for the past four years, I consider them my children. You know, and uh, being the student, dean of student growth there, just working with them with their grades, the situations they deal with at home. My doors always stays unlocked. They know they can come in, sit down, you, talk to me. You know, something else I'm seeing, though, I'm seeing a, 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 a glimmer of your mother, though. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know that's what I mean? Deep. I mean, she, no, was, that's deep. she was dedicated to the same kind of stuff that's passed on down to you. That is deep stuff right there. Yeah. You, you know what? I, it crossed my mind a couple of years back. Like I said, because my sister and I, we can't get the image out of our head of the of the people running up to her in random places yeah. saying, you never lost hope in me. You never gave up. Yeah. And, and here I am now that we just graduated our class. A lot of those students are sharing d really deep things with me about like who I've been to them for the past four years. And um, and uh, it's it's yeah. it's rough. man. <laughs> and by rough, I mean, it, it'll bring you to tears when you understand how God's working through all of this. So. Um. Some of us are on the outside of hip hop. Sure. Maybe help some of us understand the beauty of how that reaches people's hearts. Absolutely. So uh, <clears throat> hip hop, we all know this is a, a product and baby of, you know, urban inner cities in New York, right? We're talking the Bronx. Uh, this yeah. is birthplace of hip hop. Um, and originally just having a great time. Start off as just good, fun music, disco, you know, and then it started turning into a more conscious effort to, to communicate realities of yeah. what was going on around, around people. Um, uh, and the genre is a beautiful thing. And you can, I always tell people, you can fit more words into a hip hop song than you can most songs. <laughs> so, and some, some of the older artists, they'll tell you that uh, that was like, that's the hood CNN, that's the hood news channel. You listen to your hip hop artists to tell you about what's going on. Um, so uh, it's unfortunate that at this point, and I'll say this over and over again, there's only a few companies that control the messages that yeah. come out of hip hop, and it's probably one of the most unfortunate things. But um, 
at the end of the day, if you want to find the good message, the pure message, it's available. Foundation's a, a clear example of that, mm-hmm. right? Um, but uh, but hip hop's beautiful, and I know we were discussing that there's poetry involved, there's bars, yeah. there's lines, there's patterns, there's all these intricate it's kind of designs. It's not just random, it's, it's very ordered. This is correct. If it ever seems random or really kind of watered down, there's something wrong. Trust me, that is not. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, um, so, so right. yeah, so, but hip hop, and, and at this point, Four Marks music is officially the Catholic hip hop that, that, that I've been presenting uh, from Tampa, Florida. Started in your garage. So, started in the garage. Praise God. So. We got an email, uh, John. Brandon from Vermont writes, how can Christians be better about sharing the good news of Christ with a apathetic world? <clears throat> Do you think music can be an effective way to help evangelize the culture and speak truths to people who otherwise might not darken the doors of a church? Interesting. So I, I feel like art still at the end of the day is it starts the discussion, yeah. right? But I will tell people all day, never rely on art alone for your direction, mm-hmm. okay? Art will start the discussion, and if, it, you know, if you're fortunate and God wants you to have it, you'll come across some artists who will truly, truly convey every message God needs you to hear. Um, so, um, but, but, but yeah, so it needs to happen though. The art does need to reflect it because there are, because that could be the bridge. And that could be kind of that segue for people who are outside of the church. I was thinking about that. One of my favorite books is a book called uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, mm. classic book about racism yeah. in the South. But one of the reasons I've always just, in fact, I can't read that book without getting tears in my eyes because of the power of the story. But the, the beauty of that story is it isn't preaching. Yeah. It's just telling it's the story. reality. Yeah. It's telling the reality. And when you get encountered by the reality, so it's kind of like you said, it's it's not necessarily the clear message of the art. The art is the way that introduces you sometimes into the emotions of the reality yeah. of the pain in our culture, which I think that's a book that that did that. And uh, and we're living in a time of great pain. This is correct. In our culture. Do you think hip, hip hop is one of those uh, uh, bridges during sure. this difficult time. Absolutely. It's a universal language. And we found that out just going to the World Youth Days, watching people oh. from different countries who would come over and start rapping with us in different languages. And we realized that hip hop, there's something so beautiful in, in hip hop art that, that God has allowed this, this world to enjoy for some time. So we need to use that tool for good. And there's some people who completely are turned off by it. They say, no, it's bad music, it's horrible things. But what our, our motto is AMDG. Right, the Jesuit motto, and we know all things can be used for God's glory, and we'd like to turn it up. Like, think we turn the volume all the way up, and we will pump those sacraments and everything. We'll give the fullest reality, the fullest. It's not just watered down, simple gospel. We're going to tell you everything that helped us. Got about a minute and a half, John. Let's say that there's someone watching, African American watching, who says this church isn't for me. This church doesn't want me. What would you want to say to them? Young man, young woman, I'm going to tell you right now that when I decided to come back into my faith, I was about 19 years old, 20 years old. <clears throat> um, I remember getting ready to go back into the church just to try to, t- the least I can do is walk in those doors. And I could almost, almost audibly hear the devil laughing at me. He said, none of these people look like you. What are you doing? Get out of here. And then there's this battle happened right at that doorstep. And it was like, but you need to go get that you, Chris, John, you need to get in there. Mm-hmm. And I decided, you know what? The devil has been trying to kill me my entire life. I'm going to go get the Eucharist and any foul looks or anything that does come my way. I want to take that hand it right over to God because it is suffering and I'm willing to endure it. I've read the lives of all these saints. I'll take it. I'll offer it right up to God and I'll tell him to do something with that to help somebody else or me. And it kind of just accelerated everything. And at some point, it wasn't about the church or the community. It was such an intimate relationship with God through those sacraments that did it for me. And uh, there it is, young man, young woman, if the people don't look like you, God looks like you. He looks exactly like you. Like our Holy Father just recently said, we've got to make sure we look for the face of Jesus and everybody. We've got to look for the face of Jesus and everybody. That's what we're called to do. 
and we're also called to make sure they could see yeah. Jesus in us. Yeah. Because we cover him up with so much of our of our failing. John, what a wonderful yeah, privilege it has to have you on this the program. Good, yeah. Thank you very much for joining us and God bless you and all your work and your witness and being a father and a husband and all those great challenges in life. Thank you so much for joining sure, us. Sure, sure. Want to thank my wife. Thanks, babe. <laughs> <laughs> that, wonderful, John. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I, I pray that John's witness and journey is an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you next week.